want to leave earlier, like continue with the programs. Yeah. And the next person to speak is uh, Joanna Hong. And uh, Joanna has so many things she did. I, can't, I don't know the whole thing. It's just unbelievable. All that she has PhD, MS, PhD. I don't even know what that means. Masters of Science and History. Oh, Masters of Science in Public Health and a PhD. And she, now she works for um, the Environmental Working Group. Uh, she's a senior scientist and toxicologist. That sounds so scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, the title, I mean, what you have to do. Genius. But uh, I want just to say one thing that uh, the Environmental Working Group is dear to my heart. It was started by Ken Cook, a personal friend. I know him since ever, I think, as uh, must be 25 years. And uh, the Environmental Group is now 15 years old. Uh, we're 20. It's 20. Okay, then I know him at least 25 years, if not more. So, uh, and he started an organization which is an environmental and public health research and advocacy organization based in Washington. And she has, she probably give you information and, and, and also um, how, to, how to find more information about the environmental working group. It's called EWG, and it's a wonderful source of information. Like your, your question of the beaches, you can find it over there. If you want to know what kind of sunscreen you use, what kind of hair color, what kind of cream, what kind of lipstick, they have an answer. What kind of vegetable has the most pesticides or fruit, they have an answer. What the water, the scent of water, anyway, she will tell you. I'm very happy that you came. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, lunch was delicious. It's Thank great to be here. Um, most of what I prepared to talk about is uh, pesticide related, but you can throw any questions, BPA, um, uh, Teflon, at me. You know, be legit. <laughs> um, so. A large part of, of what we do at EWG is um, we like to give people information to make informed and healthy decisions when it comes to consumer product choices. So as Nora mentioned, we have databases um, on sunscreens, we have databases on cleaning products, we're coming out with a database on food, and these are resources people can use to, um, to find products that are um, safer in terms of cleaning products, perhaps things that don't contain um, chemicals that cause asthma. And um, this is, it's great that I'm talking, that I'm here, I'm talking about the pesticides today because yesterday we released our um, shopper's guide, which basically takes um, testing data that was performed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And we report which types of food have the highest levels and the most amounts of pesticides and which foods have the lowest levels of pesticides. Um, we encourage people to eat organic um, because it's not just what you are, what what is put in front of the table, you know, at the end of the day, there's some life cycle issues with pesticides. Um, but, you know, organic is expensive, it's not always available, so we have a dirty dozen list of those um, foods that have the most pesticides and a, what we call the clean 15 list which are the fruits and vegetables with the least amounts of pesticides. So that if you have to make a choice between conventional and organic, those clean 15 items, um, you may need to feel more comfortable eating if you want to reduce your pesticide exposure. Um, so we just finished our analysis of the USDA data. Um, and in terms of the dirty dozen list, I have a cheat sheet here, um, because there's 12 of them. We found that um, the fruits and vegetables that contained the highest levels of pesticides and the most amounts of pesticides were apples, strawberries, grapes, celery, peaches, spinach, sweet bell peppers, imported nectarines, cucumbers, cherry tomatoes, and imported snackies. And I brought with me a little pocket guide that has a list of the dirty dozen and the clean protein that you feel free to take with you. Um, I also have a pocket guide on healthy cleaning and, and meat eaters, so th there's a few things that I can give to you at the, at the end of the lunch. Um, some of the more notable findings in terms of the dirty dozen list is that every single 
sample of um, imported nectarines that the USDA tested was positive for at least one pesticide residue and 99% of the apples. So those were some of the right. So those were some of the worst actors in terms of our list. Do the pesticides penetrate the, the skin? They do. So so what USDA does when they do the testing is they prepare the fruit as you would at home. So if it's a banana, they don't just homogenize the whole banana. They peel it first and then. So the pesticides get through the banana skin. Um, bananas were not on our list. How about the apple? If you peeled the apple, some of them do. You would still have migrate. some pesticide into the flesh. Yes, that is correct. Some of them do migrate. So it's not just a matter of washing or peeling everything, because they do have the ability to permeate into the actual flesh of the fruit or vegetable. What about the vegetable in there inside the Like lettuce or potato? Potatoes actually have the most amount of pesticide residue by weight in our, in our study. Um, and, and really what it depends on, so, so what we're looking at is they do a market basket analysis, so they're actually going to the grocery store, shopping for these things and then testing them. Um, so what you're seeing is usually um, residues that are associated with um, treatments that people apply during storage. So that's why apples are so high in pesticides, because you know they're only grown during one time of the year, we can buy them at any time. And so they have to put something on those to prevent them from spoiling or scalding. So if, you, if you buy them in season, I mean, are there any, did the test change for those apples that are available in season rather than those that have been stored? Um, some of them that have been stored may have different types of pesticides on them. But conventional apple, apples are generally treated with pesticides. Okay. There, so. yeah. um, if it says if you buy an organic apple, does that mean absolutely no chemical pesticides were put on your apple, or are there allowed chemicals that could have been put on your apples and they're still called organic? It means that there are no synthetic chemicals that are used on the apple. Um, organic farmers are allowed to use certain things, such as um, biocides or pheromones, which sort of repel the pests. Uh -huh. um, I will say that um, some organic foods do have detectable synthetic pesticide levels, but that is because these are persistent pesticides that were banned 30 years ago and are still in the soil, unfortunately. So sometimes you will be able to detect things like DDT metabolites still on our fruits and vegetables. Um, and, and, and this isn't just organic, this is everything. Because they're so persistent, they stay around for so long. So the lesson there is really, you know, we should never use these things in the first place, and we need to make sure that you know chemicals, whether or not they're pesticides or other things, are properly tested and safe before they're put in commerce. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's good news; it's not always gloom and doom. Um, so that we have the Clean 15 list, um, least likely to test positive for pesticide reg residues. Again, I brought guides with me that I'll um, I'll hand out afterwards, and these include um, avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, cabbage frozen sweet peas, onions, asparagus, mangoes, papayas, kiwi, eggplant, grapefruit, cantaloupe, cauliflower, and sweet potatoes. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean pesticides were never used. Um, you know, they may have been used early in the growing season, and um, they're just no longer present on the fruit or vegetable anymore. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some um, ecological and environmental issues later, since we're sort of just focusing now on, you know, what you're getting at the end of the day. Um, avocados were the cleanest out of the Clean 15. Only about 1% of them showed any detectable pesticide residues, which makes sense because you take the skin off before you, um, before you eat it. 89% um, of pineapples, 82% of kiwi, 80% of papayas um, had no residues. In general, when the USDA um, tested, about 65% of their samples were positive. So a little over half tested positive for pesticide residues, whether or not they were organic or, or conventional. Um, what do you mean? Organic tested 65% of organic tested mm -hmm. No, this is for their entire sample. They tested a very small percentage of organic. Most of their samples were all conventional. I think like perhaps 5% of them were organic. Most of those were clean, except for occasionally you do have a little bit of contamination with these historic pesticides that unfortunately are still present in the soil. 
Um, we also have um, something that's important to me as a toxicologist. In addition to the Dirty Dozen, we have something called the Dirty Dozen Plus list. These are um, fruits and vegetables that didn't have the number and levels of pesticide residues on them to make our list, but they did have pesticide residues of specific toxicological concern. Usually what those are are organophosphate pesticides. So, you know, when I begin my education in toxicology, organophosphate pesticides are toxicology 101. They have a very specific mechanism of action um, on your, your neurons. Um, we know exactly how they work. And there's epidemiological evidence, meaning studies in people that show they actually do have adverse effects, particularly on the developing nervous system. So there, um, there are studies that are done in the Salinas Valley in California showing that children um, that were prenatally and postnatally exposed to organophosphate type pesticides actually show um, decreases in IQ, problems with cognitive development, um, there's some issues with motor response and coordination. There was another study done in New York where they used to use an organophosphate pesticide <laughs> called propyrifos um, frequently to treat residential areas. They found the same result there. Um, and there's also a 2012 study that's more recent looking at Ohio, well, moms in Ohio, that shows um, the babies that were exposed to the highest levels of pesticides in utero were born smaller and sooner. And this study was done after 2000, when a lot of the organophosphate uses were restricted because people recognized they were so bad. So this really <coughs> points to, um, you know, while we, while we have some restrictions in place, and that's good, um, last year, green beans made our Dirty Dozen Plus list because of the very high levels of organophosphate pesticides found on them. They're no longer used on green beans. We are making steps forward, so that's very positive. But they're still being used, and we're still seeing health effects, um, potential health effects, after these major restrictions have been put in place. So the message really is we're, we're getting there, but, but we can do better. So you tell me the organophosphate, what do they do? I mean, what are they, what is their benefits for the plants, and what is I mean, what they do for us? You say they're bad for nurses. They're they're really good at killing bugs, um, but what they do to people is they bind to um, a very specific enzyme in your brain, and um, they can bind permanently to that enzyme, and so this causes neurological effects. Um, and your, ba your body basically has to regenerate, it has to remake that enzyme once the organophosphate has permanently bound to it, which is a process called aging. Um, there's a class of pesticides that have a similar mechanism, they're, they're called carbamates, and we did detect those on some fruits and vegetables too, but they, the, the bonding to the enzyme isn't permanent. So they're not as bad, but they're certainly not good and definitely not one of my favorites. Um, if I could get rid of <laughs> two um, classes of pesticides that are still in use, it would be the organophosphate. So basically it's a spray against insects. Yes. It's, and it's how often toxic. do they spray, do you know? Um, I, I don't know how frequently they okay. spray. Why do you call organophosphate? That throws you off. Well, car uh, carbon, right? Any, anything with the, with the carbon base is organic. Right. So it's a carbon and phosphate based type pesticide. Is this pesticides or fertilizers or both? These are pesticides I'm, I'm strictly talking about. But they're digging into the soil, aren't they? Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, um, groundwater contamination is a big issue. Um, I can talk a little bit about that too. So this actually leads me to the, to the next sort of topic I wanted to touch on. Um, when we were doing our analysis of USDA um, pesticide testing data, we also looked at, at a few other sort of new interesting things that are happening in the world of pesticides. Um, I mentioned the organophosphates as being bad. Um, a lot of those are being replaced with a class of chemicals called neonicotinoids, which are traditionally thought to be much less toxic to people in, compared to organophosphates because they, have, um, they don't have that affinity to that enzyme I was talking about in the brain. But they have very high affin affinity to the enzyme in insects. And so they're very highly toxic to insects, well, perhaps not so much to people. So these are being used in very large volumes currently in the US. Um, 
there are several issues with these pesticides. The first